one of the leading analysts now in rugby and in sport. And I'm delighted to say that joining us now is Stephen Ferris, former Ulster rugby player, former Ireland rugby player, a lion and TV god these days, Stephen. You're never off the box, are you? Uh, we all got to work. Like, you know, we all got to pay the bills, Thomas. But no, was, um, I've been working very hard, especially over the last couple of weeks. The Six Nations obviously kicking off. Um, so down with RT with the Six Nations and then um, domestically, like we have Premier Sports, which is a few games back on the BBC, a few games back down on RT down south. So a bit more free to air stuff, which is great. Um, it's ever changing, as, as the other lads mentioned. You know, the rugby game is every couple of months, it just seems like it's going in a different direction, especially as, as you know, Thomas, in the, in the broadcasting world. So it's about keeping yourself relevant and enjoying it and I'm still enjoying it so you know hopefully it's a it's another good year for me and for for everybody involved in Irish rugby here on the island of Ireland. Yeah I was going to say are you enjoying it and uh, just to, to jump subject for a minute but you know your career finished earlier than expected because of injury and like that's a massive void in your life Stephen so like, are you enjoying it how have you found that transition because it arrived for you earlier than most? Yeah I think it did yeah I hurt myself back in 2000 and uh, 2012 um, against Edinburgh, just a, a lazy old game on a Friday night. Um, not much on the line. And yeah, I was supposed to be playing for Ireland to follow up two weeks later against Argentina in the Autumn Internationals. And like, I remember Declan Kidney telling me, ring me up, you know, before the game. Hadn't played that much early on in the season. He says, no, you know, Steve, you don't have to play in this game. You know, just get yourself right. And I was like, look, I need to get half an hour under my belt bit of game time before leading into Argentina. Oh, you don't have to, you know, take it easy now. You know, you don't have to... I tell you what, I wish I had taken his advice and not played that game of rugby. But um, here, I, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing, and um, hurt myself and a couple of years battling back. But it was a big injury, and I know everybody involved in sport, um, you know, suffers their fair share of injuries, and it's just about how you respond. And I responded by hanging up the boots. Um, actually, the BBC Northern Ireland with you know, Stephen Watson, yourself, and other lads involved in there got me working a few games. I was probably a little too controversial um, when I first started it, but maybe that's what got my foot in through the door. Uh, and then, yeah, just sort of, that was the springboard to kind of work on more games, uh, pick up international games. And then the highlight was probably heading to the Lions tour to work for Sky Sports on that, you know, with, with some of the greats, Ian McGeekin, you know, Alex Payne, who you know is one of the best presenters in the world. Um, audiences of four to five million watching, um, you know, the British and Irish Lions versus New Zealand. And you know, that's helped me an awful lot. Good man. Gaelic Games, when did it first register in that brain of yours growing up? You're from McGabry, aren't you, originally, Stephen? Yeah, 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 I am indeed. Um, predominantly a, 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 a Protestant area, um, you know, Lisburn as well. Um, went to school there. Um, so even coming through school, all the high schools played football, all the grammar schools played rugby. And, and that's the kind of way it was. Maybe not until I went to, I left school at 16, went to the tech for a couple of years. And, you, you know, you integrate with different personalities and people from different backgrounds at tech. Um, and then I went and played for Portadown under 18s. And we actually, there was a couple of lads who just kind of joined our sessions to keep their fitness up. Like, you know, they didn't play that many games, might have played one or two at that level. But it was more just the enjoyment of keeping their fitness levels up, a bit of rough and tumble. Um, they could work on their skills, especially, you know, the, their aerial skills were very, very good. And they came from the local clubs around, uh, around Portadown. Um, there's one in particular, is it Kieran Oog, is it? Or what's the one? Kieran Oog, Portadown. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, that was my kind of first taste of, of meeting fellas, integrating with them, actually playing um, and, you know, working in a, a team environment with them. So, yeah, and then, of course, you... As time moves on, you know, you, you start to know a few of the players, you start to play on a few golf days, you meet a few more lads. And, um, you know, thankfully now, every time I go to the gym, Connor Myler seems to be, to be there doing, doing arms, like all his biceps are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, uh, yeah, that, and that's where it kind of started originally. What was your perception of Gilded Games growing up? Because it hit you when you joined Tech as post-16. So you've lived a lot of your life with Gaelic not really involved in it. Um, and how has that changed, Stephen? You know, I'm just going to ask you to be brutally honest. Though. What did you think of it growing up? Um, and where where have you changed? Where, or has it changed? 
like uh, oh, I've a number of cousins. Like my dad has uh, six brothers and two sisters. They're from you know, um, Andy's town originally, and my dad you know, didn't spend any time there. Moved 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 out pretty sharpish. Um, but my my grandfather then moved to, and a few of my uncles moved to Newcastle, uh, County Down, and he lived just above Donard Park. And you know, Don, around Donard Park, there at the bottom, there was obviously pitches. Um, knocking about now. I always used to go down with my, my dad, kick the ball around. Um, and there's obviously lads there with hurling bats or you know a Gaelic football in hand. And I had a few cousins that played for club um, around you know County Down. And yeah, if a, an All Ireland semi final was on the TV, I would have sat down and watched it. You know, even from the, the age of seven, the you know now I would say you know sat down and watched it. Watched it. I find it mesmerizing just how these lads could just keep on running and running and running and uh you know it was uh, a great spectacle to watch at times and of course you know way back then too there was always 50 cuffs you know there's a few big hits and um i love my boxing as well so uh yeah it was good to kind of watch the olden days you know it's changed quite a quite dramatically as has rugby for the better of course but um yeah um my perception of gaelic games back then was one that uh it wasn't a sport that I would have went out of my way to watch um, just because I had a love for football, I had a love for rugby when I went to grammar school. But I wouldn't have, if somebody turned around and said to me that they played Gaelic football, I wouldn't say, ah, what are you playing that for? Like, you know, I definitely had a, a, an interest and in listened to people. And um, as I've grown older, I've certainly lo- learned a lot more about, you know, Gaelic, the clubs, uh, the amount of time and effort the boys put into training, you know, listening to even reading through some of Rob Carney's um, statements that he made when he went back and was playing a little bit of, uh, was a Cooley he was playing for, you know, he played yeah. minor football and he was just saying, like, these boys are jumping in their cars for an hour, hour and a half every night after a full day's work, going to training, you know, training for an hour and a half, jumping back in the car, going home to family, wives, you know, kids, whatever. Um, so a lot of respect, I think, is uh, the key point to come out of that question for me, Thomas. What do you think of those that outreach work that's going on, particularly between you know football, rugby, and Gaelic? Um, you know, breaking down stereotypes, you know, challenging perceptions, and you know, you even talk about it yourself. We've sat on the stage many a time, and you and Rory Best and Doshi McCombell, and I could see your guys' faces sometimes whenever Oshin talks about it, and you're thinking. Let me, we're getting paid for this here and paid a right bit of money and these guys are kind of doing roughly the same as ours. I'm a wee bit embarrassed, but no, I'm happy enough we've got good pay. That's that's up to you. Uh, Nick, there is an element that doesn't make sense, but from an outside perspective, what do you think of that work going on? And, you know, if you have kids in, in years to come and they said to you, Daddy, you know, I, I want to play for the hurling club, uh, I'd rather have that than rugby. Dangerous conversation maybe, you know, but um, would you be open to that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, as my body gets older, like I, I probably would steer my kids away from playing a contact sport. And if you had asked me five years ago, six years ago, whenever I hung the boots up, you know, I had youngsters, would you want them to play rugby? I'd say absolutely yes. But the game is getting so fast and so physical, um, so many injuries constantly. And like my way of life now is certainly much different compared to when I was 21 years of age, taking the, the rugby pitch for Ireland for the first time. Um, mobility, and it's only going to gradually get worse. So absolutely, Thomas, if if my daughter, who's seven months old now, wanted in six, seven years' time to go down to the local PA club or Kamogi club or whatever to throw a football around, or, um, no problem whatsoever. And I think a lot of it comes from, from school, you know, where you kind of feel that you're good at. Um, you kind of get pushed in a, a direction as well. Um, lots of different schools are obviously rugby's so prominent in the Belfast schools. So yeah, I'm quite happy to let my kids or even friends who want to try something different to go and do it and experience something different because um, you're going to be bump into different walks of life, as you say, and um, it's only, that's only going to be a positive thing. Yeah, and I'm quite interested as well, Stephen, because like you know, people might be aware of this, but you know, if you're going to play rugby for Ulster and play rugby for for Ireland, probably you're probably going to go to one of those grammar schools. 
you've come up yeah. maybe through that system, you've played Schools Cup and, and you may be getting through the Ulster Academy or the Leinster Schools or you know, whatever way that is. Yours was slightly different. You're one of the very rare players who actually didn't go through that system and kind of came at it through the club, which is probably more similar to Gillick Games than maybe, maybe necessarily a Schools thing. So how did you find that? And I suppose doing it a different way, yet still reaching the top. Yeah. What advice would you have to anybody here that maybe didn't get to play the McCrory Cup, didn't maybe get to play the McGeehan Cup, or did maybe get into through that traditional sense, but still wants to play at the very top? What would you say to that person? You know, like, I remember walking into underage camps, like, especially under 19s, when the club players came together with the schools players, and they kind of laughed at me, like, you know, they were like, oh, there's your man, like, plays number eight for Portadown Rugby Club. You know, and they've just won the Schools Cup for Enster and Methody. And um, I, I sat in a different corner. There was different cliques. And, uh, and like, that happens. Like, you know, we're, we're teenagers growing up. And, you know, you're always going to side with your friend. And, like, I definitely felt like I was the odd one out. And I remember sitting down with Barney McGonagall, my old schoolmaster at Friends, who now does a bit of managing for the underage uh, grades of, of Irish rugby. And, he turned around and I remember speaking to him one night and I, I was staying in a hotel and I was like, I just constantly feel like I'm in a hotel. I'm sharing a room with different lads who don't really know me. I haven't been involved in the school system. And he says, Stevie, out of this squad that you're in, that under-19 squad, there'll be one player, one player out of that whole squad that'll probably make it and go on and play for Ireland. I was like, all right, okay, dead on, Barney. And never for a second did I think that that one player would have been me. And, like, even when I was getting into Ulster, I still didn't believe I was going to become a professional rugby player for the next 10 years. Um, I was sort of, like, still working in the factory up the road, like, and, you know, helping my mate out paving driveways. And, um, you know, by the way, you can read about all this in my autobiography. If, you know, you can buy it at easons.com if you're, if you're <laughs> stuck. <laughs> but, yeah, and, and, and to go back on that point, anybody who, who is in a similar situation playing club rugby just tipping away and you do maybe have aspirations to play at a higher level there's always somebody there watching there's always one person that'll walk away from that and go here you see your boy Stevie Ferris playing tonight for in the Nutty Crust on the Wednesday night against Arge he, he was unbelievable man of the match you know, incredible performance then the Nutty Cross is on two weeks later and there's maybe another fella goes along and says here what about that fella Stevie Ferris two man of the match performances in two weeks he's, he's unbelievable by the way, I hear, he, I hear he's in contention to make the Irish under-18s team. And before you know it, there's a phone call, there's an email sent, there's maybe a conversation with your parents, and it just snowballs. Thankfully, I was involved in a pretty handy uh, under-18 team as well down in Portadown. So we were we were finding ourselves in semi-finals and finals. So, yeah, just keep banging the door, keep banging the drum. If the, if the door slightly opens, you got to make sure and run straight through it. And that's, that's what I tried to do. You know, my kind of mentality and focus was to be the best player in the pitch every single time that I, that I took it. And that might sound selfish, especially in a team sport. But when you're coming up through the age grades and you're fighting against all these school players that are wanting to knock you over, you have to think about yourself at times too. Um, and yeah, that was the kind of attitude that I, that I brought into it. Obviously, that changed when you played with better players. You didn't have to shoulder as much responsibility. You could rely on, on, on your teammates not to make mistakes. Um, and that's when you become, you know, an even big, a bigger and better team. So, yeah, just uh, just keep working hard. Uh, that's what I did. I had to make a lot of sacrifices along the way too. Um, not as many nights out at the coach and Barn Bridge as I would have liked, but uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's what sometimes what you got to do. And very lastly, we've been talking a lot about volunteering and getting people involved in the clubs. And that's no different to Gilly Games that is for football or rugby or whatever the sport is, Stephen. But if there's something that you think could be off the wall, um, getting people involved in clubs, so there's a particular focus in GA clubs here at the minute, but maybe not necessarily the normal person who's involved, attracting new people involved in the club, not necessarily players. What advice would you have? How would you do that? I think... My club that I have an affiliation and association with at the minute is Dungannon Rugby Club. Like I moved from Portadown under 18s. Uh, Jeremy Davison was the head coach there. He's now coaching in Breve and doing a, an okay job there. And 
18 years of age, playing against lads who have been around club rugby for all their life. And something about Dungannon Rugby Club that still stays with me is that they welcome me with open arms. Anytime a player came, it was, come on into the bar afterwards, come on in, get a pint, come on in, we'll, we'll get you some food, come on in, we'll do this, do that for you. I've walked through the door of hundreds and hundreds of rugby clubs all over the world, not just here in Ireland. And there's very few that I can say are in the same level as the clubs here in Ireland for opening their arms, making you feel welcome. And that stays with you forever. Like, you know, there's nothing worse than going in and somebody giving you an odd look and going, geez, what's, what's your man doing here? Like, you know, you feel a bit odd. Um, so anybody who's involved in clubs, somebody comes down for training, make them feel welcome, bring them in, even if they're not the best player. You never know what background they're from might have a multi-million pound business that they own and they could throw a few quid at the club going forward. You just don't know who they are. So don't judge people just on first appearances or, or, or how you see them. You know, bring them in, get to know them. And that's something that I certainly have taken away from Dungannon. And Dungannon uh, have kept evolving. They've lost a lot of players. They've dropped down the tables. Um, they've got a really strong minis now. Under-18s team's doing okay. The women's team is flying again. Um, just advertising now as a director of rugby, putting in 40k a year job. Um, and they've done so much work to the clubhouse. Uh, and I think you got to keep the, the wheel moving, don't you? you? You can't just stop dead because it's a business at the end of the day as well. Uh, and it's got to function. And if it doesn't, the players will slowly disappear. The crack and the camaraderie at, at the club will, will start to disappear. It'll start to get a bit of a bad name. And that's that's the wrong way to do it. So just it's about sticking together in local clubs, making people feel welcome and, and making sure when they walk out that door that they want to come back again, Thomas. Yeah. I can just see everybody in the call now thinking, 40 grand a year, right? What is it that I do here, actually, maybe? Uh, interesting, interesting stuff. Listen, uh, we'll leave it there, Stephen. No worries. Did you watch, did you watch the Ireland final last year? Did you get a chance to see it? I did indeed, of course I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I have a couple of buddies, other friends now, you know, like all these drone lads. It's probably like I played, I played golf um, up at Bally Liffin with um, Michael Murphy a few years back and Starry Boy, of course. And we had great crack and even just that um, friendly banter around the golf course and getting to meet those two lads. Straight away, I went on to social media, started following them, started following other lads, started having more of an interest in Gaelic football, started watching Tyrone versus Donegal up in Donegal when Tyrone came up the year before, when Tyrone came up short. And I was looking at the, uh, the, the Gaelic football pitch going, how are these lads even playing in this? They were, were, like, they were wearing ice skates. There was just muck everywhere. It was crazy. Um, my wife was sitting, I was actually streaming it on the laptop. It was maybe on um, a BBC online or something, Thomas, streaming on the laptop. And I was like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I feel the drone lads are playing here against Donny Gold. I'm just seeing how they're getting on. Uh, and now, obviously, I bump into a few of the boys and um, watching the comments on a few other lads to see so regularly. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll continue to watch it. My friend Johnny Davis, who was SNC at, at Trone for a while, he's now with Monon. Uh, I train with him quite a lot. Uh, one of the best in the business. I worked with him at Ulster in Ireland for so long. So he's been uh, he's been keeping me updated. Would ring me on the way back from Monaghan training. You know, let me know what the boys are getting up to, um, and you know uh, the progress that they're making. So yeah, I'll be watching. Uh, you know, for the for the next uh, couple of seasons, see how all the boys that I know go. Good man, Stephen. Listen, great to have you. Thanks very much indeed. And the, the broadcasting, the analysis, and everything else like brings I'll us great to have you on, man. Great I'll to have you. On. I'll keep bluffing it. Thanks. Keep <laughs> going. Here's brilliant. Uh, yeah, thoughts of Stephen Ferris. Brilliant stuff, Stephen. Good, good to have you.